Good morning and welcome to First Baptist Church Sunday service. Um, let's open in prayer and then we'll get started. Father, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this chance to, to get together in fellowship and to study your word, to hear your music, Lord, hopefully. And Father, we just ask that you bless our time together. Help us each to give the gift that we have to somebody else today, as well as to receive gifts from each other. Thank you, Lord, that you love us and that you are the reason we are here and that we're going to be doing the things we can do. Thank you very much, Lord, and just bless us now. In Jesus' name, amen. We are doing Barb taped because she's not here today. And we have the videos.
All right, thank you, gentlemen. Okay, let's get back to this. What is a miracle? Uh, I told you a few weeks ago when I was doing my series on the Bible, um, we did one on called Book of Many Miracles. And when I finished that little session, I said I was going to spend the summer looking at miracles, looking at the particular Jesus' miracles. Um, when I got looking back on sermons over the years, I realized there's never been a lot of messages on the miracles that Jesus did. We've told you, oh, go read them, and we've talked about them kind of fleetingly, but not really spent some time and said, what does it re- what's it all about? Why did that particular miracle happen? And so today, we're going to start on our discovery of the miracles. And I'm sure most of you have your own idea of what a miracle is. So if I was to ask you, what do you think a miracle is? What would you say? And we've had such a funny weekend in here already. What would you say? What would you say a miracle is? An event that can't be explained. Good. And? Tough, isn't it? Jacqueline. A thing that comes from God. God. Cool. An event that can't be explained that comes from God. We're getting there. A A healing that is outside the doctor's realm. Which I love doing because I love doctors being amazed. <laughs> there you go. Healing, which is through God. Okay, anything else? Oh, I'm sure some of you have ideas. Even kids, you have ideas of what a miracle is. What's a miracle? Babies, Babies are miracles, absolutely. A miracle can be as simple as, I don't understand it. It can be as simple as that, but that's not the definition. So today we're going to look at what is a miracle. And we're going to look at what the world says, and we're going to look at what God says. And we're going to see how they work together. So first of all, let's go to a definition from the world. Webster's New World Dictionary defines a miracle as... Something to wonder at. An event or action that apparently contradicts known scientific laws. A remarkable thing. Something to marvel at. A wonderful example. Now you don't see anything in there that really says anything about God. Except that they do say it's an action that apparently contradicts known scientific laws. It goes against what we expect. It goes against the norm. It goes against what they will try to explain to us and, and, and figure out. It shouldn't happen. Con- the concise Oxford Dictionary of the Christian Church states, because they're a little more inclined to look at it from a biblical point of view, a miracle according to the traditional view is a sensible fact produced by a special intervention of God Transcending the normal order of things, usually termed the law of nature. You ever heard that term? The law of nature? 
or Mother Nature. People have heard that one. Okay, that's the science world trying to explain the part they can't define. It's that thing that happens and they don't know why. And so they call it the law of nature, mother nature. It's just evolving. It's, it's happening. The, po- the possibility of miracles began to be questioned because you have to understand in the Old Testament, miracles were expected. The whole society knew about miracles. They didn't necessarily attribute it all to God or our God, but they understood miracles. But we get into the 17th, 18th century, and now science really kicks up. And it starts to explain things. For instance, right now, if all of a sudden I disappeared, and don't go wishing that, okay? But if all of a sudden I disappeared, and you couldn't see me anymore, and all of a sudden I walked in the back door, was that a miracle? Or was that magic? Sleight of hand? misdirection I mean they have those magicians out there who they call themselves that uh, that can make a building disappear all right they now have the ability to put pictures and print on a tiny tiny thing smaller than a micro dot way beyond anything we can figure out and look at ourselves they have to have an electron microscope and all these kind of things But you can do it. You can print on this tiny little thing. Is that a miracle? Or is that science? Well, the scientists will say, that's science. We've developed. We've evolved. We've we've come further and further and further. And there's nothing that we cannot do. Therefore, there's nothing that can't happen. And then, like Marilyn shared, all of a sudden, somebody is really badly sick. And boom, they're not. And the doctors go, we don't know. It shouldn't have happened because God stepped in. And that's where the science goes out. Smith's Bible Dictionary says, in the character of miracles, and this is talking about why they're there, why they happened, okay? They were all beneficial, helpful, instructive, and worthy of God as their author. You see, there was a lot of things happening in the Old Testament and even in Jesus' time that were eventful. They weren't miracles, but they were eventful. People were were changing their thinking. The rules were changing. Society was changing. And it wasn't because of miracles. It was because people were developing. And things were changing and getting a little more modern all the time. Guess what? 2,000 years later, I think we're still in the same rut. We're slowly kind of trying to learn things and develop things and grow new things, and it's just different. The Encyclopedia of the Bible gives us these thoughts on miracles. Now, that's a book. If you've never used an Encyclopedia of the Bible, I recommend it. In fact, I tell you it's good reading because it jumps all over the place, but it gives you so much history, so much information about what was like in those times and why those things happened and what was going on and, and do that. So it's just a nice compilation of, of, of history. One of the striking things about Jesus' life and work is the fact that he did miracles. Even his enemies agreed on this. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Even his enemies who did not want to believe that he was the son of God, who did not want to believe that he was the Messiah, who did not want to believe that he was God, agreed that he did miracles. The miracles are sometimes described as mighty works. That's one way of trying to take away from God. They are done through the power of God, though, so that mighty means mighty God. We sing songs about mighty God. Okay, and, and so even though when they try to throw a name out there to distract you from God, <laughs> they have to put that awe part in there. A miracle is still a miracle. It's got this part that they can't explain. The miracles are sometimes described as mighty works. They are done through the power of God, the most important display of God's power. The greatest miracle, and I mentioned this last time I talked about miracles. The greatest miracle was when that tomb was found empty on Sunday morning 
and Jesus wasn't dead anymore. That was the greatest miracle that mankind has ever seen or had in their history. Because that one little thing, simple little thing. I mean, he wasn't the first one to be brought back from the dead out of the grave because he brought Lazarus back out. But that one was a final one. That one was the biggest thing because that miracle, that person coming out of that grave changed our world. Changed everything. It disrupted that whole culture, that whole civilization. Rome was never the same again because of that one simple person coming out of that grave. Not so simple, eh? But that's what they called it. Jesus' miracles are also called wonders. That's another word that they're used by a lot of people. Well, they were wonders. He did wonderful things. Again, what a wonderful God we have. That word is so connected to God that, we, that I look at it and go, they're just trying to find some other name, and they just keep using things to describe our God. And I don't know why they do that, but they do. Doing miracles, Jesus was showing people the kingdom of God. Did you realize that? Miracles were not just to be creating something unique or, or, or fantabulous or healing. There was a purpose for that. He did not heal every person. He still does not heal every person. Some of you are sitting here with ailments or, or disabilities or uh, mental issues. And he hasn't healed them. You've prayed about it. You've asked other people to pray about it. The elders have prayed over you about it, and it hasn't been healed. God doesn't always heal because miracles have a purpose. Jesus never did a miracle that there wasn't a purpose. There wasn't a reason for it. He gave his disciples power to do miracles. Read in Acts, you'll, and, and further on, you'll read about how the disciples did it. And there's even some times where when they went out to do miracles, it didn't work. And last time I shared, when they came back to Jesus, and said, why can't we do that? Getting rid of a demon. And it was all about their faith. All about their understanding of what they can and cannot do, and where the power comes from. You see, because without God's power, you can't heal somebody. You can't do a miracle. You can be an incredibly wonderful person. You can do incredibly majestic things, but you can't do a miracle. Because we go back to what did you guys say a miracle was? An act of God that defies science and nature and everything else that's out there. They continued to heal after Jesus saw them at Pentecost. That's when the Holy Spirit came down to them. Okay? And they continued to heal. And the miracles remained part of the experience of the early church. One of the things that I, I like about this is miracles didn't stop when Jesus walked out of that grave. You don't hear about them so much. A little bit there for, for a little while with the, with the disciples. But after Jesus leaves goes back to heaven you don't hear about them anymore because you know why we have been deprogrammed there's a big word for a pastor to say okay we've been deprogrammed we've been taught that those aren't miracles that they can explain it away that it's just something neat that happened because to, uh, to call it a miracle they have to put God in the picture and the world does not want to do that. Doesn't at all. Let's go back to another miracle in the Old Testament. I did some last time. I'm going to do one now. I'm not going to go through this miracle because you guys all know it if you've been involved in church very long. But you can look it up in, uh, in the book of Daniel. After God's miraculous protection of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young men who refused to bow to the king... When the king put the order out that everybody had to bow because they were, they were getting trapped. 
It was a setup. And they refused to bow to the king, and so the king had no choice but to throw them in the fiery furnace. He was going to cremate them for their disobedience. And of course, the story is, they didn't die. They didn't even get singed or burnt or hot or smoky or nothing. And the next time the king went there, they opened the door and he said, are you guys still in there? And out they came. And the king threw all the people who had set them up <laughs> into the fiery furnace. And he then made a decree. And in Daniel chapter 4, verses 2 and 3, I want to tell you what he said. This is the before he goes into his whole dream thing. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders, his kingdom as he is an eternal kingdom, his dominion endures from generation to generation. So the king is saying, this incredible God, most high God, has done miraculous signs and wonders. Remember at the beginning I said there's words, they call it wonders, majestic works, all these different things. Even back in Daniel's time they were talking about it like that. But only this time he's attributing it to God. And then he says, his dominion endures from generation to generation. You are that second generation. Well, it might be 500th generation, but that's why we're here. Because God's dominion is still in power. It hasn't gone away. Man has tried everything it can to get God off this earth. And to get God out of your minds and out of your lives and out of your whole thinking and being. And it's not working. I don't know about you, but I don't know if I could spend 2,000 years fighting against something and still think I'm going to win. But for some reason, <laughs> Satan seems to think that and he gets people believing it. It's not going to happen. After God's miraculous protection of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar made that statement, and then he went on with a dream. And I encourage you to go read Daniel 4 and read that dream, because it's a real eye-opener. Here's a king who wasn't necessarily believing in their God, but he changed. Remember I mentioned back a little bit earlier in this today that it's the change in people that, man, we can't explain, science can't explain the change. It's because the Holy Spirit touches your life and becomes part of your life and they can't explain the Holy Spirit. They can't do it. They'll tell you you're crazy. They'll tell you that you've been indoctrinated, that you've been... You've been taught this so you believe it because people like to do that. We like to believe things, don't we? I mean, seriously. If somebody said to you, show me how you figured out to change your life, what are you going to tell them? Without using the Bible, how do you tell them? Well, one day I felt different. One day I just quit thinking that way and I changed my thinking. One day, one time, something happened to me. If you ask Paul, that wonderful guy who was going around killing all those Christians, what happened? Actually, it was Saul then. What happened? Well, one day, something happened that changed my thinking. Now, he didn't have this to change his thinking because Paul knew that book at that time. It was the Old Testament at the time. Paul knew the book. He knew everything about it. He was a scholar. He was a theologian. He was all those things. So that book did not change his life. The story of the Old Testament people and all the acts of miracles and things in there did not change his life. 
He knew all that. And he still persecuted the Christians. It was the day he met Jesus. And his life changed. And he could tell everybody that day. Or that year. Or that time in my life. God took over. And it's important that we know that. It's important that you understand that we have that. And science can't explain it. I can't explain it. I just know that's what happened to me. One day, I met God, and I knew. The Holy Spirit primed me up for it, and when it came, I knew. So let's go to the fast forward to Jesus' time, and let's take a look at one of his first miracles. All right? And... It's a time when he was walking on the earth. It was a time when he was a man and he did all these miracles. And if you want to go read them, go read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're full of these stories and we're going to go there so you can follow along with me throughout the next few weeks through the summer. I want to go to Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4. And if you're writing things down, you can also find this in same story in Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 42. And Luke 5, verses 12 to 14. Same story, same basically story. Okay, Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 to 4, and we start with 1. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. It's talking about Jesus. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And we're going to go explain that in a minute, Okay. Verse 3 says, Jesus reached out his hand and he touched the man and he said, I am willing. He said, be clean. I want you to remember those two phrases. I am willing and be clean. Immediately, the man was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone. Don't go yelling around, yelling around. Going hallelujah. Can you just think about this though? You've had this illness all your adult life, and all of a sudden, in a blink, it's all gone. I think I wouldn't be able to keep it quiet. I think I would be running up and down and screaming, hollering, shouting, and dancing, and oh man, and I would be going everywhere I wasn't allowed to go before. Okay? But Jesus says, No, don't say anything. But go and show yourself to the priest. And offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. I'll explain this in a minute. Okay? So here's the little story. Man with leprosy. Jesus comes. The man says, I, I trust Jesus that you're gonna, you can heal me if you want. And Jesus says, I want. And boom, done. And then he says, don't say anything. The guy is supposed to go off and see the priest. Webster's Dictionary defines leprosy as a chronic Infectious disease of the skin, flesh, nerves, etc., characterized by ulcers, white scaly scabs, and deformities. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever looked into leprosy or figured, tried to see what was with leprosy. It was a pet thing of mine 40 years ago. And I've kept connected a little bit with a thing called the leprosy mission. Um, but it's an ugly disease. An ugly disease. And it's not a fast killing disease. It's a very long, drawn out, painful disease. And in those days, in the Old Testament, in Jesus' time, it was an unclean disease, which means you are banned from society. You cannot be where people are. You are on your own, and you can't go near anybody. Um, it was ugly. In, in Leviticus chapters 13 and 14, you can go read them later. Leviticus 13 and 14, it's a very descriptive two, two chapters about skin diseases, leprosy being one of them, okay? But it clearly tells you what you're looking at. It clearly, clearly tells you how to tell what it is. It clearly tells you how you can get either told you got to go off by yourself or you get to be clean. Because the priest is the one who does that. 
And if he pronounces you clean, if you're healthy again, then you have to give a bunch of sacrifices in a certain order. And then you can go back into the society. You can be back amongst the people. That's why Jesus told this man, go to the priest, get him to tell, say that you're clean because you got nothing, it's all done. And then do the sacrifices. Follow the culture so you can fit back into society. So you can become part of it. Because if he would have just went running down the street doing what I thought I was going to do, they would have probably executed him. Because they had nothing saying that he was clean. So he had to go through this process. And Jesus knew that. Okay? Okay. I started a stamp collecting box. It's at the back on that back shelf over there. Okay, it's a nice glass box. You can see into it and there's stamps in there. I started that 40 years ago because I discovered the leprosy mission on Eastern Canada. And the leprosy mission is where the lepers go because they're not part of the society. Back then they weren't anyway, 40 years ago. All right. And the stamps, we, I send them, gather them all, fire them off down there, and they take those stamps and clean them up, and then they separate and they sell them. And the money is used to look after the people in the mission and research. Because unfortunately, the government doesn't see it as a big enough event to give funding to. So there's not a lot of research done by the government on leprosy. And it's just one of those things. So it was a little thing I could get started. And this church has generously filled that up up until the last few years, filled that box up at least once or twice a year. And we fire them off down there. And they, they have all these stamp buyers that they know that they, they, they can sell them and get money for them. Okay? Now, since we've been locked down and, and uh, mail's kind of slowed down, um, I don't get as many stamps. But if you're going through stuff, here's what I'm going to tell you. If you're going through things and you find old envelopes with old stamps on them, quarter inch around, all the way around, cut it off, throw it in that box, and it will be useful. Don't just throw it in the garbage. That's my plug for the leprosy mission. William Barclay, in his commentary on Matthew, says... Leprosy might begin with, and this is a little bit detailed, leprosy might begin with the loss of all sensation in some part of the body. The nerve trunks are affected. The muscles waste away. We have current day diseases that sound like that. ALS, MS, lots of those kind of things. The tendons contract until the hands are like claws. You've all seen older people with hands that don't work right. Okay? Not saying it's leprosy. I'm just saying you got to, so you're visual, okay? Your hands get crippled up. Arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis does that to people. There follows ulcerations of the hands and feet. Then comes the progressive loss of fingers and toes until in the end a whole hand or a whole foot may drop off. The duration of that kind of leprosy is 20 to 30 years. It's not a fast disease. It is a kind of terrible, progressive death in which a man dies inches by inches. In fact, they call it a living death. Immediately when leprosy was diagnosed, back in those days, when you were declared a leper, you were immediately and absolutely completely banished from human society. And so they would go off to what they called leper colonies. We got a modern day name called a mission, all right? But they would go off to these colonies because nobody could be near them. Go back to Leviticus 13, 14, you'll find out. It was real taboo, like real taboo. And so you, you just absolutely would not go near a person like that. I mean, think of the story of the, of the Good Samaritan, all right? This man gets, this, this, this guy gets beaten up, thrown in the ditch, and the pious church leaders come walking along and cross the road and go away around him because he was a, he was a, he was a, a not a clean person. And finally, a Samaritan who doesn't know anything about that kind of stuff helps him. 
and says, I don't care what he is or who he is. I'm going to help him. Well, that's what Jesus did when he came to earth. He said, I'm going to help everybody. It doesn't matter what your problem is. I'm going to help you. I'm here to help. Erdman's handbook also tells us that to the Jew, lepers were unclean, untouchable. Jesus could have healed that man with a look, with a word. He could have. He did that. We're going to read about miracles where it was just, he just said something or he looked and it happened. But he didn't do that. Instead, he reached out and touched this leper. Jesus was a Jew. Knowing full well that that was the absolute worst thing you could do. And he did it. Talk about breaking the rules. Talk about breaking the taboos. But he did it because he loves people. And he went on to teach us that it's that love that overrides those rules. It's not rebellion. It's not fighting. It's not my way or the highway, it's I love you and I will look after you and protect you. Barclay, William Barclay adds, there never has been a, any disease which so separated a man from his fellow men as leprosy did. And this was the man whom Jesus touched. To a Jew there would be no more amazing sentence in the New Testament than this simple statement and Jesus stretched out his hand and touched the leper that was an amazing statement because they just never would do it absolutely not i think of the lockdown that we've had for the last couple of years one little bug that has absolutely <laughs> isolated us and we're all upset about it even though when we were isolated we could do it with groups we could do it with our families and we could do it we weren't completely isolated a person with leprosy could not be near anybody else but a person with leprosy. You weren't allowed to go anywhere. You weren't allowed to do anything. We have had a mild, mild version of a lockdown or isolation or whatever you want to call it. And you know what? I don't see any of us looking really bad for what we went through. Are we upset? Maybe. Maybe. Do we hold bitterness in some things? You shouldn't, but you do. Okay? But it really wasn't that hard. Unless you were one of the ones who got sick. Or you lost your job. Okay? Then you suffered. The rest of us were inconvenienced. It's the word I like to use. Okay? Let's go back to these three through four verses. Verse one's pretty easy. It tells you what happened. In verse two, we see the leper approach Jesus. And he doesn't do it as a sick, evil, scared person. Okay? Lepers would not come near you. Lepers would not even look at you. Lepers would not even communicate with you. They would go far away from you if you were there on the road. Because they weren't allowed to be near you. They, they, they were dirt. They were nothing. They weren't even recognized as human. And yet this man came right up into the presence of Jesus. Boldly. Confidently. And he, he, he just said, you're God. And if you're willing, I can be healed. He knew who God was. He knew who Jesus was. He knew the power. Now, he hadn't seen Jesus heal a whole bunch of people because Jesus at that point hadn't yet. He just knew. And he was confident. And he was bold. And I got to sit here and say, wow. I think that's what makes God so different for us is that when we go to God, we don't have to cower, we don't have to be fearful, we don't have to be um, uh, worried about our life because that, our God just loves us. And he wants to have a relationship with us. He wants to be part of us. And so we can go to him boldly and confidently, but reverently. He is God the creator. 
But we shouldn't be scared to go to God. When Jesus died and rose again, and you remember on the, uh, well, we'll go back to it someday, but when he's on the cross and he dies, it's black, there's lots of noise and crashing and banging, and the big, huge tent that was called the church had this big, huge curtain in the center. And nobody but the priest, you know that guy that the leper has to go talk to? Nobody but the priest was allowed to go in through that curtain to the Holy of Holies. So if you wanted to have any connection with God, you had to go to the priest. And you had to give your sacrifice, and the priest took it in and, and did it for you. That was your way to God. And when Jesus died on that cross, that, that wonderful veil, curtain, whatever you want to call it, ripped in half and went open. And never again do we have to go through or send somebody else through. We're allowed to approach that altar of God ourselves. You can put yourself into God's presence and don't worry about it. You don't need all the sacrifices. You don't need the priest. don't need me. All right? You can go in the presence of God. Verse 3, it says, we see Jesus telling the, the leper that he's willing to heal and then tells him he is clean. Those two phrases, remember I told you? Remember what they are? I am willing, be clean. He dealt with two things that that man needed. It didn't matter what everybody else thought. That man needed to know he was accepted. He needed to know he was important. He needed to know he was worth it. And Jesus says, I am willing. And then he needed to hear the words he was never going to hear. Be clean. Jesus didn't have to preach a sermon to this guy. He didn't have to. He said the two things most important. What did he say to you? What's the important thing that Jesus said to you to make you know you're his? Think about that. It should mean something. And whether you've been knowing God all your life but you can't remember exactly what day he found you, you can remember what he said to you that caught your attention and that you hang on to. What's the thing that you hang on to as a Christian? Because that's the thing that, that, that holds you to God when the times get ugly. When we go through persecution and isolation, there's something that you hang on to. Think about what that is, because it's there. Verse 4 has Jesus cautioning the man not to tell anyone except that priest. And I did a bunch of reading, and, and there's a lot of theories out there about this. But the biggest ones are is that Jesus did this because it was early in his ministry, early in his time with the disciples. And if he started letting it be known publicly that he was doing all these healings, two things were going to happen. The mass crowds were going to storm him because everybody with a complaint and the ailment would be there. Okay? And secondly, all those big, huge Roman guards would come and take him away because he would be going completely against where their authority goes. And he didn't want to be taken away yet. He had some work to do. He had some things he had to do. So that's the accepted theory that, that it was those two things. He didn't want to be swamped by the crowds because then he'd get nowhere. And he didn't want to get taken away. He wanted to finish what he was there for. So he tells this man, don't say anything. Now the neat thing is he's God. He knows darn well the guy was going to do what I would do, and he was going to run all over the place and tell everybody. Because it's an amazing thing. A miracle is an amazing thing. It just is. 
And we need to realize that. A miracle of healing. That was what it was. And Jesus performs it and his disciples perform it. And it, it, it's, there's a bunch of them. We're going to look at a bunch of them. But they all had a purpose and they were different. When you go through and you read all the miracles of Jesus, they might look similar in the sense of what they were. But read the context of what's going on at the time and you'll see, and we will see, that there is a lot of things different about each one of those. Different purpose, different reasons, different things going on. Jesus came to us as a man, as a human being, being able to feel everything we feel, being able to be disappointed, being able to, 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 to uh, get traumatized. That's the way they call it now, we're traumatized. Okay? But he did that so we would know that he understands our daily lives. He understands what we're going through because he went through the same thing, humiliation, temptation, crucifixion, persecution, abuse, neglect. I can keep on going. All those words you want to throw out there that we use as, well, this is why I'm like I am, and this is why I feel like I do. Jesus did them all in that short time that he was there. But he did it so he could say to you, you, each one of you individually, I understand what you're going through. Because I did it too. That's why he did that. And you know, we're going to do communion here shortly. And that's to remember that act that he did by going to that cross and dying on that cross. Not because he deserved it. He was God. He didn't do anything wrong. He did it because he wanted us to be clean. Just like that man with leprosy. He wanted us to be clean. And he knew the only way that we could do that, the only way he had to die on that cross. Isn't that crazy? And when you think about it, isn't that crazy? I'm going to go and die for a bunch of people who don't even care about me. I'm going to go and suffer and go through all that hoping that they're going to get the message and that they're going to pass it on. And that's our job, is to pass it on. But that's what Jesus did for us. We have allowed our bodies, our spiritual bodies, to become contaminated and sick and weak. And Jesus says, I've got a cure for that. You just need to believe, and as I said last week, and then do the will of God. Find out what it is. If you've never searched that, you should search it. What is God's will for me? There's lots of verses out there that will help you. Once he taught us how to live, once he showed us how to follow God, and then he said, all right, training wheels are off, and you're flying solo. Go! And that's basically what he did to the disciples. He gave them three years of his life. He tried to teach them everything he could and to get them ready, but there came a point where, as Val likes to say this, the mother eagle gave them the boot out of the nest. And they had to fly or fall. And that's what Jesus did. But he just, he was really nice. Because he didn't say to those disciples, you're on your own by, I'm gone, and you got nothing. You better have learned. I hope you did. He said, oh, oh okay, I'll leave the Holy Spirit here. And he will be your guidebook, your map, your inspiration, your encouragement, and all that kind of stuff. But you have to listen to him. Every time that we get off away from God, it's because we quit listening 
to the Holy Spirit. Jesus promised he would show us, and he didn't say, but, and he'll use a stick on you. And he'll give you beepers that tell you when you're getting out of the lane. He doesn't do that. But he does have his own way of getting our attention. He taught us how to live. He taught us how to follow him. And now he wants us to be bold and to go forward. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in His blood. in prayer and it's been a day but it's been a good day and God loves us isn't that so neat let's pray Lord thank you for this day and thank you for giving us a unique day one that we won't forget for a long time but Lord it's a neat day too because it's all about you we did this for you Lord and I just pray Lord that our our singing and our words and our fellowship is all in honor of you Guide us as we go through this week. Encourage us. Get us excited for you. And let us know that even in simplicity, we can grow and we can learn and get energized. Thank you, Lord, for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a wonderful week.